So Promising Young Woman is a thing. I'm hoping you've at least heard of this film. It deals with what I think are really important topics, and I've seen a lot of people around the web talking about those, so that's a good thing. And to be honest, I'm not really certain that I enjoyed watching this film. But I did like what it had to say. And by that I mean I have no idea whether I liked any of the characters or their actions. The movie wants us, the audience, to root for Cassie, but a lot of her actions are questionable at best. But I think this is the point. No one is really innocent when it comes to the topics this movie is dealing with, and Cassie uses incredibly alarming tactics to throw this back at people. Also, that ending was absolutely unreal. Most movies don't really handle twists well, but this movie threw a curveball and it worked really well for the story, and then it threw another twist. But instead of undermining the first one, it just builds off of it. And neither of those twists cheapened this movie by any degree. There is a lot to unpack with this movie. From the costumes, to the set design, to Cassie's arc as a character as she attempts and fails to move on, the subversion of the revenge story, everything down to the color saturation, the framing of characters, the props, even the camera angles and how that in itself can tell a story. By my own admission, I am the last person to be considered an expert on costume or set design. And as far as cinematography and framing go, I would ask fellow cinemaster and filmmaker Nate about that. And as I said, people have been analyzing the narrative of Promising Young Woman all over the place. So I guess I have nothing to talk about. Not so. Because in every way that Promising Young Woman is presented to the audience, in every tool the craft of filmmaking employs, including the ones that I mentioned, this movie shows that it is aware of the fact that it is being watched. And what struck me the most about this particular movie over other movies that play with this exchange between camera and audience is the careful and purposeful choice of casting. And that gives this movie a kind of voyeuristic quality, as it's very aware of how its audience will view it. And so today, I want to talk about Promising Young Woman. The movie began with actor Emerald Fennell having an idea for a scene in which a young woman pretending to be drunk confronts a man when he starts to remove her clothes without consent. With the Me Too movement becoming more prominent, Fennell began to feel that there was a pushback from quote unquote nice guys, as they said they would never do something like this. But what she understood was that there are shades of grey and that those who see themselves as nice guys do not necessarily embody niceness. The result of this was a screenplay that Fennell then tried to receive backing for. This did not go the way she was hoping as many of the studios interested tried to turn the story into a classic revenge story, which would have defeated the purpose of Fennell's movie. Finally, she managed to partner with Margot Robbie's production company, Lucky Chap. Fennell was also given the chance to direct the film, which she accepted. The cast was solidified with some really big names. Carrie Mulligan, Bo Burnham, Clancy Brown, Jennifer Coolidge, Alfred Molina, Alison Brie, Laverne Cox, and Chris Lowell, as well as a slew of others that we'll come back to. Despite being set in Ohio, the movie was filmed in Los Angeles. This worked in favor of the casting as it allowed for smaller roles to be filled by people who would not have otherwise been able to appear in the movie due to contractual obligations or film schedules. This also allowed the movie to be completed in a mere 23 days of filming, which is ridiculously short for a movie of this scope and budget. The exigency around filming and finishing the shooting also had to do with the fact that Fennel and the studio needed the movie to be completed quickly because, oh yeah, Fennel was in her third trimester while directing and gave birth only three weeks after finishing. What a badass! Also, I think it's worth noting that the name of the movie Promising Young Woman, as it's important because of how it evokes the phrase Promising Young Man, which has been brandied about in the public eye in regards to the topics that take place in this movie. It's clever and worth pointing out. The movie was screened at a few festivals where it had rave reviews from fans and critics. Unfortunately for the creative team behind this movie, it has been nearly impossible to catch it in theaters, which would have added a whole other dimension of communal viewing while the audience collectively squirmed in their seats. And I definitely squirmed. Like I said, I did not enjoy watching this movie, but I liked everything that it had to say and the way it made me feel uncomfortable. But here come the spoilers, so if you don't want to feel gross or if you just haven't seen the movie yet because seriously that double twist is absolutely worth experiencing firsthand, then be warned. I'm still reeling from that. The movie follows Cassandra, or Cassie, a young med school dropout as she goes out nightly to stop slash show guys that they're really not that nice by pretending to be drunk and then confronting them when they don't listen to her because they think she's drunk. She does this because her childhood best friend Nina was assaulted by a classmate while at a party and no one believed her. When the classmate in question, Al Monroe, returns to the area, Cassie sets about getting revenge on each of the people who played a part in either denying Nina or perpetrating the crime. 
In a conversation with Nina's mother, Cassie is told that it's time to move on. She attempts to do so by spending more time working on herself and cultivating a new relationship with a young doctor named Ryan. But when one of the women that chose not to believe Nina was assaulted comes forward with a video of the assault in question that was apparently passed around at the time, Nina sees that Ryan may not be as innocent as he seems. Cassie sets out to get one final act of revenge by showing up to Al's bachelor party as a stripper, and then under the guise of a seduction, attempts to carve Nina's name into Al's chest, only to have him escape her handcuffs and then suffocate her to death. I did not see that one coming at all. Al and his friends dispose of the body, but at the wedding, the police show up and Ryan receives a scheduled text from Cassie in which she had planned for something to go wrong. The video was released, her body is found, and they have Al Monroe arrested. Double twist. Before I get to the point of the casting, I do want to make a note of the way this movie is split up. There are points in this movie that are almost textbook romantic comedy, right down to the cheesy pop music and montage. <laughs> But then there are other parts of this movie that are played like a horror or thriller. Even the music in these parts is scored as though it is a thriller. The difference being that Cassie is the killer, and you almost expect her to actually do it a couple times. Which is fucking nuts. The one time it looks like she was actually going to go through with violence, she does show restraint. Okay, back to the casting thing. Normally when a movie plays out, the goal is for every part of the craft of film to come together and allow the audience to achieve some degree of believability. The term that gets thrown around is the suspension of disbelief, and this is the same phenomenon that stops so many people from getting into musicals. The act of characters singing out their feelings to further the story ruins some people's suspension of disbelief. If it wasn't for the fact that this is an entirely subjective and personal experience, I would say that those people are objectively wrong. How do you not love a musical? But generally, the goal is to keep the audience in this state of suspended disbelief so that the story can hopefully convey the intended message to the viewer. There are a few exceptions to this. By now, most people are probably familiar with breaking the fourth wall, but this is usually done for comedic effect or for storytelling purposes. Oh, hello. I know, right? Whose balls did I have to fondle to get my very own movie? It is still uncommon to outright show the behind the scenes of how a movie is made. This includes the actors. A great actor or actress should become the character and the audience should cease to see Kate Winslet acting and begin to see only Rose's story in the Titanic. Promising Young Woman doesn't do this at all. It engages in something called metacasting. Now I tried to find some scholarly sources on what metacasting is because I like to cite my work, but the only thing I could find was information about metacasting as it relates to TV tropes, and this isn't exactly what I would call a great source, so most of this is going to be based off of my opinion. Metacasting is when you cast an actor with the direct understanding that the audience watching will understand the purpose and position of the actor in a way that goes beyond the narrative of the story. It brings in real world knowledge of the actor, and the film works because it expects the audience to know this. The most common form of metacasting is called typecasting. This is when an actor or actress is prone to playing roles of a certain kind, and the audience or film industry has trouble seeing them in any other kind of role. The way Carrie Mulligan is most famous for playing period drama movies might mean that before Promising Young Woman, she was typecast. The audience expects actors to do a good job in that role based on their previous works. But as I said, they might struggle when they see this actor in a different kind of role. Another kind of metacasting is when you cast an expert in a role rather than just an actor. For instance, Natalie Portman was a research assistant and helped publish a paper on object permanence in infants before graduating from Harvard, so casting her in the role of a research psychologist may add some credence to the character. This can also be done comedically too, as metacasting can also be used as a kind of wink to the audience. This is most famously done in cameos, where an actor will play a nondescript role, or sometimes even themselves, as a nod to their past work with another cast member. For example, the way many members of the show community are featured as voice actors on episodes of Rick and Morty because of their relationship to Dan Harmon. Or the super meta cameo of Danny Pudi playing Abed as a background cameo in the episode of Cougar Town, which is then referenced later in an episode of Community. I'm still trying to figure out how they pitched that one to the studio. Lastly, metacasting can sometimes happen in reverse. Writers and showrunners may realize an actor has a talent or is well known for something, and then write a scene or episode that puts that skill to use, such as Melissa Benoist getting her start on Glee and then being cast in the role of Supergirl, where they wrote an entire musical crossover episode, not just for her, but all of the very musical co-stars in the Arrowverse. So it's not as though metacasting is a new thing that Promising Young Woman has invented, which is going to revolutionize the way movies cast actors, but instead of using the metacasting as a nod or a hint to one of the actor's past roles or connections to one another, it has metacast almost every actor in the show. 
Carrie Mulligan has been cast because of her ability to keep Cassie grounded as a character. Her background in more serious roles means that this role was not too over the top. Her skill makes it believable, not to mention Mulligan famously played the lead in a movie called An Education about a young woman who is led astray by an ill-intentioned man. That same movie features Alfred Molina as Mulligan's father. Here he plays a lawyer and has some weirdly meta conversations with her in regards to an education. Cassie's parents are played by Clancy Brown and Jennifer Coolidge. Clancy Brown, other than being famous for his voice work, is almost always a militant or angry character. In this, he's a kind and loving father. Jennifer Coolidge is well known for playing roles that especially show her vanity and sexuality, probably most well known for Stifler's mom in the American Pie series, but in this movie I didn't even recognize her. Both of these are interesting metacastings because they're a subversion of the typecast that I mentioned previously. But of course, where this metacasting works its best is in the almost sinisterly diabolical way each of the nice guys is cast in this movie. From the very start, we get none other than Adam Brody, who plays the quintessentially nerdy nice boy from the OC. From there, we get Neil, this overly neurotic nice guy played by Christopher mintz Blasse, who often plays these kinds of characters that are some combination of down-on-their-luck nerd and nice guy, and it works. The main antagonist of the movie, Al Monroe, winds up being played by Chris Lowell, who's been the consummate nice guy in his roles on Private Practice and Glow. And when we meet him, he's still those kinds of things, and he portrays his character in this pathetic way that makes him so infuriating as a villain, but it's absolutely so important for this movie. Toward the end, we're also introduced to Al's friend Joe McElmore III, who's played by Max Greenfield, and this guy is the consummate bro. Greenfield, the actor, seems like he's actually a really cool dude, but he's most famous for playing a similarly bro character on New Girl. It would be easy to see Schmidt slowly turn himself into this kind of sexist, punched-up fraternity fuck that we see Joe McElmore III is in this movie. Also, what a fucking name. Lastly is Cassie's boyfriend, Ryan. Bo Burnham may have some offbeat and dark humor, but he always has this boyish charm, and through his comedy, he's tackled some incredibly deep and complex topics. Not always with the most tact, but always with a genuine approach to tackling the subject in a positive manner. With his directorial debut of 8th Grade, a movie he also wrote, he's been seen as a bit of a people's champion in the way he created an alarmingly real portrayal of an 8th grade girl. Bo Burnham is also a nice guy, and you want to like his character, but his lack of action at a key moment feels like a betrayal to Cassie, who believed he was a good person and would do the right thing. But also it's a betrayal to us, the audience, who also wanted him to be good because Bo Burnham is just so disarmingly charming. Burnham wasn't even looking to act at all during the making of this movie, but he read the script and was totally on board. He understood what the movie was trying to say about this character and what his casting would mean for the film. Instead of creating a movie that pushes the history and recognition of the actors aside to try and tell a story, Promising Young Woman embraces the fact that audiences recognize actors' faces and often associate them with roles that they have seen them portray in the past. There are likely more connections and actors that I'm missing because I'm not a human version of IMDb. But I do think the point of the story is so much about what it means to see and experience uncomfortable situations, and that is evident in everything visual about this movie. For me, the most interesting thing is this purposeful use of metacasting. It's taken to such a high degree of complexity and for such an important message. By purposefully prodding at the audience's suspension of disbelief, it draws attention to who these actors are and why we might associate them with roles from the past. And that is one reason why Promising Young Woman was so uncomfortable to watch and why that makes it even more important to do so. I do want to mention that this movie is a dark comedy, and I'm not really sure it would have worked with any other kind of tone because of the nature of how the story comes across. The scene where Cassie is killed is horrible, but it's so expertly crafted, and the implications behind the loss of identity of Cassie as she is suffocated, plus the phrasing Al uses, and the fact that the scene lasts for a whole two minutes, and all of this is played against the fact that we never saw the video on the phone. Everything about this movie made me very uncomfortable, and I would highly recommend it just for that. Plus that double twist. Hey, thanks so much for watching that video. If that made you uncomfortable, then good. But you can cleanse your palate on lots of other great episodes of This Is A Thing, as well as our weekly podcast. I want to hear your thoughts about Promising Young Woman down in the comments. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share the video if you can. And you can always catch more great content right here on Cinemaster's Ultimate Timeline.